All right, I think we're going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's great that so many people signed up and could make it to the session. We're very excited to bring you this session, which is part of a, a larger series on building back better in, in different ways. Uh, this session in particular is focused on changing work for the better. So we're really looking at the effects that the COVID crisis has had on workplace and especially on equality, productivity, and well-being in the workplace and what organizations can do to avoid sliding back into pre-COVID norms that might be uh, bad for equality, productivity, and well-being. I'm going to set a little bit of context, so just spend a few minutes talking about the motivation for the session and then introduce our speakers and the flow of the conversation and then we'll sort of hear from each, each speaker before going into a Q&A section at the end. So if you have questions, uh, we would ask you to just put those questions into the Q&A function here on Zoom and we'll sort of try to get to at least some of those questions at the end. So just to give you a little bit of context, the reason why we wanted to invite these speakers to talk about uh, the session, um, and, and I should say, my name is Johannes Lohmann. I uh, lead our work on employment and organizational behavior here at the Behavioral Insights team. Uh, but the, the context for the session really is that the coronavirus has completely changed many fundamental dynamics of the world of work. On the one hand, of course, they, it has introduced many new health risks and uh, a lot of job insecurity for many workers. On the other hand, a lot of workers are now sort of, and firms are navigating working remotely and working more flexibly uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. And that on the one hand has of course generated many challenges in terms of communication, ensuring uh, a sense of belonging, ensuring worker well-being, but it's also generated some benefits and we'll talk about this a bit more in the session. Uh, in particular, we think that wider acceptance of flexible working could really be quite beneficial to equality in the workplace. Now, in the US, in the UK, and in parts of Europe, we are sort of in between two states, I would say. The, the lockdown state, which uh, really saw a lot of people very suddenly change their working routines and, and, and also question, of course, the stability of many jobs. Um, and now entering the post lockdown state, which is where organizations probably have a little bit more leeway to figure out how to handle the situation, but that then also brings the risk of potentially falling back into unhelpful previous ways of working or just generally sort of mishandling uh, the, the, the transition back to a, a new normal. I think if we look at how firms and employees are currently handling the situation, there are some signs that employers are willing to embrace new norms more more long term. So there was a recent survey of over 300 CEOs, 70% of which said that they thought that flexible working would widen their talent pool, which is obviously positive. And 70% of them also said that they were planning to downsize offices, which could be negative, but also it points to an acceptance of the fact that this is maybe uh, for good, you know, a broader, a broader norm of working more flexibly, working more remotely. If you look at employees, many seem to be still working flexibly, and at least here in the UK, and, and at the beginning of August, there was a survey that showed about 18% of, uh, or, or that um, office attendance was at about 18% of pre-lockdown levels. Um, last week, the Office of National Statistics reported that about 60% of working adults are working at least some of the time from their normal place of work, so it seems like maybe trends are going a little bit back to working from the workplace. But in general, I think what really motivated us was that there's a window of opportunity that we have right now, and I think some of our speakers will talk to this, uh, where we're really, we have the opportunity to take stock of what has happened and to reshape potentially the, the way we work in the future for better. Okay, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our four speakers uh, that are all fantastic in the order of of speaking, which has a bit of a logical flow to it. So we've got Peter Cheese, who is the CEO of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, which is a professional body for human resources and people development. We've got Emma Stewart, who is a CEO and co-founder of TimeWise and Women Like Us. And TimeWise focuses on encouraging flexible working, encouraging those who uh, need to and want to work flexibly to get into the workplace or stay in the workplace and to shape labor markets to accommodate that. Uh, we've got Hannah Bird, who is my colleague, a principal advisor here at the Behavioral Insights team. 
who uh, co-leads our work on gender and behavioral insights and broader work on organizational behavior as well. Um, we've got Steve Collinson, who is the head of HR at Zurich Insurance Company, the UK portion of it, and Zurich actually happens to be a, a valued partner of ours. Um, and we also have Emma Francis, who will be uh, stepping in for Steve uh, during the QA, who's a senior manager of diversity inclusion at Zurich Insurance. So without further ado, I'll, I'll sort of ask our first speaker, Peter Cheese, to, to start his section. But um, just to say that we'll sort of go through those sections one by one. Each speaker has about 10 minutes, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. Um, so Peter, we'd love to hear from you about your perspective on the labor market, you know, what the trends are that you're seeing and how uh, employers are responding to the challenges that they see, um, how that impacts productivity and well-being in particular, and, and how some of the weather and how some of those positive changes that we might see uh, might be made to stick. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Johannes, and uh, hello, everybody. It's great to have the opportunity to talk on these sorts of themes. And then as Johannes has already, I think, very well teed up, we can all see this as a time of pivotal change. And the questions that I think we're now in is what will change in the longer term? Um, so the first question that, um, that I, I was going to address is how did organizations respond to uh, the crisis to begin with? Um, and where were we building from? And what's really intriguing is that I think there are many aspects of work over the last decades that haven't been particularly positive. Whether you look at stress as the biggest source of absenteeism from work, uh, whether you look at the, the growing sense of presenteeism, people just feeling they need to be present because that's how they're going to be judged, um, our lack of progress and many things like inclusion, which is a very important theme that I think runs through a lot of what we'll talk about today, um, and, and indeed productivity itself. So there are many themes which we've been wrestling with for a long time about the world of work. And now we have, I think, the opportunity to rethink some of these things. Um, the crisis itself, first of all, became the biggest experiment, if you will, in home working that we ever could have imagined. Um, I think the first thing that I would say is that so many organizations would say that they, you know, perhaps per force had to respond, they had to adapt and they had to be more agile in how they thought about their work. They had to figure out things like who were the essential workers that had to go to work and if they were essential, how did they protect them? And then of course, what turned out to be you know, getting on for roughly two thirds of the workforce um, who were working from home or could take their work and work from home, how do we support them? And so I think on the positive side, a lot of organizations that we've talked to said that you know, they were putting people front and center. And I think that as a mantra is something that I would want to pin, you know, pin my colors to, if you will. That the future has got to be much more about how we put people front and center of the business agenda. About things like well-being, which has uh, already been touched on by Johannes, is so important and yet, not something that we perhaps paid enough attention to. Yes, we were seeing a growth in things like discussions about mental health, but this, again, this crisis can be such a catalyst for that because so many organizations are saying one of the first things they had to worry about was their people, looking after them, communicating with them, making sure they're properly supported, worrying about things like their mental health in very, very different circumstances. Because whilst it might be all right for me as a boss sitting in my home office, we all recognize that many people were struggling with this. So how do we support that? So that, I think, was the first and very, very positive response that I want and believe we should be taking forward, is putting people much more front and center. Then, of course, we were into these debates about different ways of working, different styles, uh, shifting from a presenteeism culture where, as I said, if we're honest, so much of how we were judging people at work was how many hours they spent at work and how many hours they might be producing stuff from their computer screens without really understanding, perhaps well enough, about the outputs that they were creating. And that's what we should be judging. That's what productivity is based on, is your outputs, not you know, how many hours you sat at your desk. So I think we were all starting to understand now that we've got to be able to judge and communicate with other people in a different way and look at what they're producing, not just how many hours that they were working. So that, I think, was another really essential shift but also this flexibility idea which is not just flexibility about homework but flexibility about time that we work because after all a lot of the early part of the crisis for many people was characterized by well i'm juggling a lot of things all at once i got childcare going on i got young children running around and i've got to be able to deal with that as well so organizations having to respond to that and saying okay 
we've got to be more adaptive. We've got to be sensitive to when we call meetings and how we call meetings. And, and the other thing to, to link back to the well-being idea, which I think has been absolutely fascinating, is the shift in corporate cultures where we're all looking into each other's living room. We're all talking more, it paradoxically connecting with people, I think, in lots of more personal ways, which comes back to this idea that I posited at the very front, that this is about people. This is about putting people first. And I think the cultures that have started to emerge through all of this are really fascinating. And even things like the breakdowns in hierarchies, because you can't tell who the boss is on a Zoom call. And we're not in all those sorts of status symbols that we so often got used to in, in a lot of our sort of more command and control cultures we might have had in the past. So I think lots of things that employers are responding to uh, through the crisis. And, and as Johannes rightly said, we're now moving into this next phase of what happens next. And I think the first thing to say is that you know, we should not be forcing people back to work. We've said throughout that there are three essential guidelines. You've got to say, is it essential that the work is done from an office? Is it safe to do so? And that includes how I get there. And we know there are many concerns about that. And is it mutually agreed? And I think those are principles which we can take forward. So now the whole idea of Build Back Better is what are we learning? How do we now create much more agile and adaptive workplaces? And, and as Johannes has pointed to, and we've done a similar service, is most organizations are saying, yes, we intend to have more flexible ways of working. We can see that's good for people, it's good for their well-being, it's good for inclusion. Um, but also, you know, let's be honest as well, we can save costs. I mean, the, the, for individuals, you know, things like travel costs and commuting time, which has just got crazy in recent years, but also office costs and office space, and how we use offices is very different. But to address this other very important second question, productivity. That has also been quite a contentious debate because you'll hear many people, not least the government, saying you need to go back to your office because that's where you're productive. Or you need to go back to your office because that's where innovation happens. That's where the water cooler conversations happen. And I said to a journalist the other day, if your entire innovation culture and strategy is based on serendipitous conversations around the water cooler, then I think you've got other problems to address. Um, but we've got to be open and honest about some of these ideas. So just to touch briefly on productivity, um, Conflicting views, if I'm honest. I mean, the surveys that we've run on this um, said we, we ran a big employer survey in July and 28% of organizations said they thought productivity had gone up. 28%, interesting, interesting same number, said they thought it had gone down. Uh, and then about 30, yeah, the balance said they didn't really think there was a big effect. Now, I, I would also say, and this is a challenge to all of us, I don't think we're good at measuring productivity. You know, in a modern knowledge services, you know, knowledge economy services base, well, what we understand productivity is and how we measure has been actually quite a, a long challenge for us over many years. Uh, and we debated a lot as a nation and indeed many other nations debated as well. We worried in the UK that apparently we are, you know, close to the bottom of the, of the list of productivity in terms of you know, labor productivity measures. But I think some, there's some real challenges in what and how we measure productivity. And the most important thing to me, and, and when we think about building back better now, is are we understanding output? Are we being clear on what we're expecting people to do? Are we communicating those things clearly and then measuring them on output and not so much on, as I said, the, the, the old challenges of presenteeism? So there's a lot to be debated in that productivity thing, but I do not think there is any evidence that would suggest that the reason to go back to work is that's where we're productive. But it is clearly about choice. It's not about one size fits all. And there would be many people that say they'd be more productive in a workplace, partly because their home, home circumstances don't permit them. There are too many distractions. Or, of course, many young people are saying, I need to go back to the office because actually social connection is really important to me. And I can't work out of a bed suit or whatever. Or, or I'm perhaps new into an organization and it's my first job. So I need to have that physical connection. So there is no one size fits all, but I don't subscribe to a view that says the reason to drive us all back into offices is because we're not productive and we're not innovative. I think we proved that we can work in these different ways. So finally and quickly, because I know Hannah and others are going to pick this one up, you know, will changes stick and how do we embed these things? Well, I think a lot of this is about uh, belief from the top. So it was encouraging to hear Johannes' survey as CEOs. Do we believe that this is a catalyst to change, if we can change how we work? and therefore embed these from a cultural perspective, because a lot of it is very behavioral and cultural. We have got to train managers differently, and this has always been a soapbox I've been on for many years. We have done a terrible job in most organizations, if I'm honest, over the decades of training managers how to manage people. And in the circumstances we're talking about now, about how do you manage a more virtual team, how do you look after people's well-being, how do you 
connect with people in all sorts of different ways. How do we tr build truly fair uh, and open and inclusive workplaces and cultures, which is such a big message behind all of this. That requires us to do a better job of training and holding to account our managers and all these sorts of aspects. So I'm sure that will come up in some of the conversation as well. But uh, that's not for me, in, I think, in just a general context setting. But as I said, I, I passionately believe this is a time of opportunity. We've got to think about it positively. We've got to understand the issues. We've got to recognize it's not a one size fits all. But I think this can be a genuine catalyst for positive change in the world of work. So thank you, Johannes, and uh, back to you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, thank you for that contribution. Obviously, rings rings very true, you know, especially the aspects of putting people at the center, uh, not necessarily forcing people back, trying to find a way that works mutually. Um, where I would say, in some cases, obviously, the devil's in the detail, but but I, I definitely agree with the with the principles. I'd like to take it over to Emma Stewart uh, to talk a little bit more about flexible working in particular and pick up. Um, and sort of give us her perspective on, you know, what parts of the pre-COVID system might we want to leave in the past? How can we, uh, or what new behaviors and system changes do we want to encourage and maintain? Uh, and, and what have we learned and what do we know about working flexibly at scale that can inform how to really manage this transition well? Thanks, Johannes, um, and thanks very much for having me. It's, a, it's obviously a fascinating topic. I'm going to build on probably a lot of what Peter said, um, but I really wanted to talk about what we are seeing in practice in the market, um, because as you said, time-wise, we spent 15 years advising firms on flexible working. It's a fascinating time for us. We are clearly seeing the rule book um, being ripped up on how you design work and what work looks like. Um, and we're seeing huge opportunities and we are seeing many, many firms coming to us and looking at how they can change and adapt um, the way they work going forward. I guess the things that I really wanted to touch on is, is what the future does look like. Um, and, not, uh, and it's fair to say the first point is there's a big gap between uh, what many of us have been doing in organisations over the last five months, which is this rapid response to uh, remote working, and what I think we would all probably want to see going forward, which is a sustainable, really inclusive approach to flexible working. And, um, and I think it's also fair to say that this bit is going to be the hardest. Um, when everybody works from home, behaviourally, everybody is on the same page. Uh, when we start to return to offices and when we start to do what many people are calling blended working, that's when we really recognise uh, the difference, as I said, between just being very quick and responsive and being much more thoughtful from a leadership perspective, from a, a management capability perspective and from a communication perspective. And that's the gap that I think we are certainly seeing many firms really starting to grapple with now. Um, because they're having to, because uh, their employees are asking them um, very explicitly um, to, to enable them to be able to work differently long term. So, so I just wanted to sort of really sort of touch on two main areas of reflection from, um, from what we're seeing and hearing. The first is really, um, I guess, some practical sort of um, themes as to how we think organisations can bridge that gap um, between old world and new. Uh, and the second is probably at a more of a kind of macro level, what do we think some of the risks are, and particularly in relation to well-being and inclusion that firms need to look out for. Um, so, so just firstly, I guess three things really to say in terms of bridging that gap um, from our experience of working with businesses. The first is at a leadership and a cultural level, um, as Peter said, this is really critical to get right how you want your organisation to, um, to work in the future and how you want to manage your people so that fundamentally they are happy, they are engaged, they perform well, you get enhanced productivity and performance, notwithstanding it's always tough to measure, um, but also they are well. Uh, and we see that as being, at, at a leadership level, a recognition there's a difference between what we would call a request response model to flexible working, which we've had in many, many firms for many years to being much more proactive. And the request response model is wrapped around individuals. It's fundamentally work, working on the assumption that someone will ask to work differently. That's no longer the case. We've had to work differently. But what we need to watch out for is that leaders um, do not revert to a culture of we will go back to offices and if you want to change how you work, you have to ask us. The shift and the opportunity is to be more proactive as organisations in terms of this is how we want you to work. This is our vision for how 
we will enable you to do your best work. And in order to do that, that means listening, that means continually responding to what individuals say. Um, so, you know, we've seen some bad examples in the market of, oh, we just need to do something, we need to say something, let's just say two days a week in the office, um, and then we'll work everything else out. Actually, you know, we know from all the surveys, 13 million people want to retain some form of flexible working. You know, it is roughly three quarters of the market. So doing proper pulse surveys, really understanding and recognising um, that that one size fits all doesn't necessarily apply. And then trying to craft and articulate, and it's not going to be quick and it's not going to be that easy, but a vision which enables you to reflect how you want your organisation to look after its people and, and to enable them to do their best work in different ways. Um, the second thing really is, again, is the capability piece. Um, for many, many years, you know, we've been talking and supporting firms to, to help their managers to understand job design. So if we want people at scale to work differently, we are going to have to learn how to craft um, different ways of working. And that's not just working from home. That's not just uh, the same number of hours, but in a different location. Uh, and we've certainly seen it. So how much, when and where you work, understanding how to do that at scale and how to do that within teams. So again, old world is, please can I work four days a week instead of five? Uh, fine that's that's absolutely okay we'll just make it work and actually you end up being paid for four and you end up working five new world is okay let's look at where that one day goes or that two days goes and, and the impact that that will have on your team and how we can enable you in a much more framework structured way to be able to work differently so that you may all be working in different patterns but we have core times when you communicate and a classic example you know we've spent a lot of time uh, 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 in the past talking about uh, asking to work from home. Now we need to be asking ourselves, when do I need to be in the office? What are the activities and the tasks that require me to be in the office as opposed to working from home? And understanding that at a team and a job function level is going to be really, really important. Um, and then I guess the, the third area we would call out is, is, is the fairness, the inclusive and the consistency point which is if we are going to take this approach forward and if we are going to have leaders who articulate this and we're going to have managers who are trained, we need to make sure that as well as the job functions and recognising how people need to work differently, we also need to recognise individual groups of people for whom flexibility means different things. So making sure that those who have caring responsibilities are able to flex in a way that may suit the start and the end of their days, they are going to be in and out. We know schools are back. Schools may not be back for long. You know, we are going to need to adapt to how our, our caring population needs to work. We're also going to need to adapt to our younger people who can't, as we've all said, spend much longer sitting around one kitchen table trying to operate with, with, that, with a flat share. So it's recognising that that approach needs to be inclusive. And they're really practical things in terms of just, if you, if you take a practical framework to this, understanding how you know, may need people in offices still on Zoom because people at home need to feel involved and engaged in, in activity. Um, and that is about, again, once you've done the training, thinking through how you build this right through, right through to your recruitment processes as well. So those would be the three things we would just say, uh, uh, I guess, of what we are seeing what's good in the market with progressive organisations really taking this seriously, and they have been doing that for some time. Um, in terms of just briefly, I guess, some watch outs, um, particularly in the context of, of well-being, we need to be really careful at a broader level, at a policy level, that we don't spend all our time talking just about um, working from home. We have uh, millions of frontline workers who have been hugely decimated by this crisis who can't work from home. Uh, and uh, we need to be really clear that there are different ways that we need to support. Um, obviously, we've got the whole narrative around our frontline workers have helped us through this crisis. We now need to be thinking much more broadly about how we respond to our retail workers, to our care workers, um, to other frontline industries uh, who need crucially to find more innovative ways of working. Um, we're seeing a lot of really good stuff in the market. We've been doing a lot of work actually at TimeWise, in particular frontline industries already. Um, in the construction sector, I heard a story the other day of uh, somebody who had spent his nights walking up and down the track surveying the railway lines. Uh, he now has a drone because he can't do that anymore. He films it. He's far more productive. He's far more efficient. He analyzes the data at home. Some of, some of the innovations that are coming out now are really, really exciting. Um, we need to capture those and we need to share those. Same in the teaching profession. Teachers, there are big issues in teaching, 
but we never ever thought that a teacher couldn't spend any time away from the classroom. Surely they are. We want them back and they are back, but maybe there are opportunities for them to spend some more time at home if they've got their own care responsibilities. So let's just think about those sectors and I think try and tell those stories. Um, and the last point just is, is a watch out on inclusion, not to row the clock back. Uh, we are seeing some worrying signs on a gender perspective. You know, there's some surveys that are showing 47% of women are considering leaving work because that job design hasn't been done right. They can't sustain the hours. Um, you know, you can have presenteeism at home just as much as in the office. So we need to be thinking about how we how we don't row the clock back. And also, let's not forget some of those principles again that Peter knows well in relation to good work and things like progression. And actually, for offering flexibility, let's make sure you take that with you as you progress in organisations. We've got an opportunity to correct some of these issues around the gender pay gap now and just not just to do it in a, in a quick responsive way. Um, so I, my final point would be, let's, let's flag those risks as we go. Let's highlight the opportunities. Let's tell the stories of those opportunities. And finally, as businesses, I just ask not to forget that actually when we do start to rehire, let's make sure, let's not just assume that, that conversation about flexibility will happen at the hiring stage. Only 15% of vacancies pre-COVID, we know from our data, were open to flex. Let's make sure that as businesses, if you fundamentally change, that you have that opportunity to attract more talent and be explicit about it at the point of hire, because you can attract talent from all over the place now. They don't have to be within 45 minutes commute, and you can attract talent that will be more diverse, more inclusive, and bring more skills to you because you're enabling people to work differently from day one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, I think Hannah will probably be picking up on at least some of the qualities aspects that you mentioned. Uh, but I think the, the message of, you know, assessing needs, assessing different situations and making the design of the system going forward responsive, both at the macro level where, you know, as you said, many people just can't work from home. Uh, and there are many people with different situations, different needs, but also at the firm level where it's just quite important to run pulse surveys and to really assess what the needs uh, and, and desires of the workforce are is just very important. Um, also, just wanted to mention that at BIT, we actually do run uh, weekly pulse surveys and have been running since the very beginning of the lockdown. So I think at least in that respect, we're, we're sort of doing our best to do our part. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand over to Hannah to talk a little bit more about the behavioral insights perspective and sort of what we see in our work that's relevant to this discussion. Thank you, Hannes. Yes, I, I will be adding the behavioural insights perspective and, and also an uh, inequalities perspective building on, on, on Peter's points. So I think the first thing to say is, is really we, as behavioural scientists, see the value uh, at times of disrupting, uh, of disruption in changing behaviours. Uh, we know that disruptions and shocks to the usual way of doing things can sometimes result in really big step changes in behaviour. And this is really exciting to us as behavioural scientists. We saw this during the 2015 chief strikes, for example, um, analysis of commuters actually before and after the strikes found that one in 20 commuters found a different commute uh, while the tubes were down, a commute that worked better for them, and they actually stuck to it afterwards. And across 5 million passengers who use the tube every day, that's 250,000 people making a change. So we're, we're quite excited at looking for moments when these step changes happen. And a step change in working behaviours, as Peter and Emma have said, is what many of us working in work-related policy have been wanting to see for a while. In many ways, the status quo of work, the way it's designed, is exclusive of anyone who can't work full-time hours away from home. So, like Emma, we see, the, we see great importance of making work more flexible, both in terms of the times that people work and the locations. Um, it needs to work for, for humans with needs um, and for the people who need those those humans as well, those workers, uh, to be caring for them. So it's, it's an exciting time to be looking at what this shock, uh, terrible as it has been, has been doing to work behaviours. There's reason to believe, I think, um, that change will stick for a large proportion of people. Um, not, not getting into the business of saying exactly which proportion at this moment, we'll look to the data for that, but COVID has seen us hardwiring in a new normal. At first, home working, um, using Zoom, new collaboration habits, uh, working in shifts around children, felt really makeshift and temporary. And now people have literally built home offices, have sourced that second monitor, set up a VPN, and come off mute without too much reminding. 
Um, so hardware and practice is likely to help people change their behaviours. These one-time costs have been overcome and previously perhaps they were a friction too far. Um, so again, I think another reason to be quite hopeful and um, excited that um, you know, remote working has really been opened up, uh, more flexible ways of working have really been opened up. Even small changes to the status quo could add up to improvement for workers as well, um, we think. And for this, I'm, I'm referring to a study by an academic called Elliot Sherman at the London Business School from before the crisis, um, which my team and I found really interesting. Um, Elliot was looking into how much people would like to work from home in one mid-sized Cambridge office. Um, it was an office environment. And he ran a field experiment where employees were randomly invited to work from home or the office as much as they wanted in alternating weeks. And what he found was really interesting. He found that across the board, regardless of being a parent or a mother in particular, there was demand pre-COVID to work from home two days a week in that particular setting. Um, and he, he also measured the effect of offering this, um, you know, work from home as much as, as you like on things like work-life balance. And he found it didn't worsen for anyone in his treatment groups, but it got significantly better for mothers. And in addition, productivity increased for everyone. And I find this interesting to, to read now. We were reading this study before the crisis and now we are again, moving towards a two day work from home week in, in a given office setting would have felt really radical before the crisis. Now it seems like a relatively minor shift. Um, and again, as a behavioral scientist, it's just interesting to think about moving the point of comparison and how the point of comparison for the last few months has been, if you're not a frontline worker or you're not, you're not having to work um, in, a, in a workplace that's not your home, um, the anchor has changed. And this again might help us uh, move towards a new normal that is more innovative and more inclusive. But to add in the, the equalities perspective here, we really can't take these changes for granted. Echoing Emma, there hasn't only been a shift uh, to more innovative ways of, walking, of working, there's also been a slide back to a status quo that wasn't so equitable. We know that before the crisis, uh, women were carrying out the majority of unpaid care work at home. On average, ONS figures put the number of hours uh, women do um, unpaid work for adults and children including laundry, cleaning, et cetera, at 26 hours a week compared to men 16 hours a week. And during the crisis itself, we've seen different um, figures come out, but in general, we see this consistent pattern of women carrying out a far greater share of care work than men in a, in a similar pattern to before. Among those still in work, we are seeing men and women work flexibly, which is wonderful. Um, but we're also seeing one IFS study um, puts the figure at women working six percentage points fewer paid hours in work than, than fathers during lockdown. And when women, when mothers are adjusting their paid work down, they are adjusting up their caring hours and we're not seeing the same patterns for fathers. On top of this, a, a, a statistic that I found really fascinating was that women who are working are um, seeing their working hours more interrupted than their male counterparts. So just a, a kind of unfair experience of the changes in work for uh, women versus men. And I think another illustration of this comes again from academia, but we hear um, anecdotal reports from some journals of submissions of, um, of new articles from women absolutely uh, falling through the floor, just disappearing during lockdown, whereas submissions from men uh, have gone up by 50% in one particular journal. So, you know, really see um, that this matters. We know from before that a large proportion of the gender pay gap itself is explained by disproportionate uptake of part-time working amongst women. And progression for part-time workers doesn't just slow down, it seems to stop entirely. So if this particular change is sustained of a, a, a mis mismatch, misbalance between mothers and fathers and um, working practices, we really do have cause for concern. And this is before I get into um, differential impacts for um, people based on a wide variety of, of other intersectional factors, factors of inequality, um, whether we're talking about single parents, where, whether we're talking about ethnicity, uh, whether we're talking about disability, um, all of these things will add um, inequality to this question. So it's really important, we think, to design sustainable flexibility into organisations. 
we need to decouple flexible working from associations with something that just mums do. Um, we need to get rid of a stigma that associates flexible working with being less committed or unusual. Uh, we need to give individuals more autonomy and control over their flexibility, um, echoing Peter and Emma's points on um, the importance of mutual agreement um, and, and real ownership of uh, a given working arrangement. And we really think um, from a behavioural perspective that the more we normalise flexible working for everyone, the easier it will be for men and women to benefit from flex work um, and also for the benefits of the, the impact on the wider workload they have in caring for others, caring for themselves indeed. We also need to make sure that we don't confuse flex work with working all the time. And it's so easy um, for working from home to then blur the boundaries between when, when you're working hours and when are you doing other things. Um, because you know we're working and I myself and working from my kitchen table, so it's really easy for it to uh, blur into breakfast and dinner time uh, with associated impacts on mental health and family life, of course. But before I pass to Steve, I'll just quickly um, mention uh, a couple of um, insights that we have from behavioral science and recent research that we've been doing here at BIT that has identified some relatively small nudges that we think employers could use to hardwire these changes into their organisations going forward so that they do remain normal and inclusive for everyone. The first to mention and um, this um, project and finding comes out of a collaboration that we at the Behavioural Insights team have had with the Government Qualities Office since 2017. It's a program um, that I um, jointly lead now with Hannah is called the uh, Gender and Behavioural Insights Program, or Gabby, as we kind of um, call her uh, affectionately from time to time. This is a program, um, as I said, it's been running for three years and it has more than 12 partnerships or kind of real world living labs with employers where we work with employers, Zurich's one of them, um, to robustly test and evaluate workplace nudges that improve the world of work and equality. There are many results that will be coming out of this, this program in the coming months, and today I can just share one or two. The first one I'll highlight is one, uh, some results that um, we published a couple of months ago, uh, coming out of a partnership with Indeed, the global job site. We ran a trial with them last year, pre-COVID, that also seemed to produce a step change in flexible working. And the nudge that we tested there, and, and I must say it is a nudge, and, and it really um, benefits from uh, those kind of deep detailed changes that Emma was describing about job design within organizations. But a nudge that um, employers can consider um, is one that we tested with Indeed. We tested adding a prompt for employers to consider clearly advertising the flexible work options that they can offer within their organization at the point of advertising the new role. Um, we found that when employers were nudged to do this with a simple addition to the uh, job posting pathway, we saw a 20% increase in employers advertising jobs, suggests to us that um, if you make it easy for employers to make clear what they offer, uh, then they'll be more likely to do it. They might remember to do it at the point when they're remembering lots of other things as well. And then we also saw this kind of double nudge effect that when um, job seekers are, are looking for roles, for every role that had flexible working clearly listed in the job ad, advertisers got 30 job applications. Uh, compared to those that didn't clearly list flexible working, those job ads got 21. So it's a 30% increase, it seemed, um, in that trial, uh, in, um, in the talent pool, uh, being attracted to jobs that have flexible working opportunities, and that was pre-COVID. So there's more work that we need to do to understand the mix of talent that gets attracted. Are more women attracted than men? And we'll be able to publish results on this score in the next few months, but we think it's promising. We think that the flexible working doesn't only appeal to mums, it really does appeal to everyone and there's such value in that. And the second um, result that I'll very briefly mention is something we've been testing with Zurich. Um, we've been testing this change of really designing in flexibility from the start where Zurich have been working with us to switch their default of new vacancies, such that all new vacancies and the vast majority are advertisers open to part-time and job share working from the off trying to get away from that, um, that responsibility being on the part of the individual to please request an alteration from the status quo of a kind of full-time nine-to-five job. We think that's really important in terms of signaling that the organisation values uh, part-time working 
not just to new recruits, but actually to people already inside the organization about there, there being opportunities all the way up the promotion chain that they could consider and would be welcome to do if they stay in their role and continue working with an arrangement that works for them. But with that, I will pass to Steve um, and uh, yeah, over to him to talk more about this and, and all the other things that they're doing at Zero. Thanks, Hannah, um, for the fantastic um, introduction, especially around our, um, our recent changes, um, which we're really excited when uh, we're all ready to share the data, uh, hopefully not too soon. Um, like most organisations, we've listened lots to our people throughout this period, including through our now notorious lockdown survey, which I'm sure many of you have conducted um, too, with the last few months being a really fascinating into, insight into our organisation per se, and of course a really privileged uh, look into the lives of our people that we rarely get. I'll come to some specific flexible working learnings in a moment but I wanted to addr address a few cultural and organisational learnings first and I think it's um, fair to say that we have learned we have a much stronger emotional connection with our employees than perhaps we realised. It's been easy to think that the employee-employer relationship has become somewhat functional over the last few years and I firmly believe as a result of the last few months this now not to be true. I think most of our colleagues say that they feel more connected in a remote world to their leaders and managers uh, than ever and that they truly see the human and not necessarily the job. Um, our CEO has shared examples where she has, for example, in, all, in our all employee calls, um, found the need to crawl behind the sofa for her, uh, where her husband was working to rescue a phone charger so that her phone didn't die on a 5,000 person all employee call when her husband was talking to investors in Asia. Um, and the humanity that comes through the organisation has been very striking. Um, for the first time ever, our people are saying that they feel better connected or they feel better supported by Zurich, the organisation, than by their line manager. It's marginal, 87% versus 85%, but that's a very big shift for us and it's reinforced to us the importance of the organisation as an entity and an organisation being able to show that it cares for its people. I think that gives us an enormous opportunity to turn goodwill into commercial advantage. Um, I'll turn to flexibility in a second, but if we think about things like information flow, our employees, I think, have relied on us as a trusted source of information and support, which has brought a very significant responsibility to make sure that the information we share with people is timely and accurate. It's very up to date and it helps them to make good decisions. And then finally, before I get to flexibility, it's become really clear for us that automation and continuous improvement are an important key to our future success. And we've successfully automated, usually in days, manual processes that we've wrestled with for many years, delivering some really important, significant customer and employee efficiencies. And the reason I highlight this is why did it take a lockdown and a pandemic for us to change in that way? We want to understand why the behaviours which have said for many years in our organisation, it can't be done, won so often every time we had this debate in the past, and we need to continue continue to break that cycle. But let's turn to flexibility where we've had some of our starkest learnings. Um, Pre-COVID about 75% of our workforce was taking advantage of some, flex, some form of flexibility, um, but our pre-COVID understanding of the term flexibility was in reality I think relatively narrow. We decided as lockdown was approaching that flex work would be the thing that got us through this crisis, but my word has flexible working been tested to its extreme. It became really clear to us when we said to people managers, trust your people to simply do what they can in the context of everything else they're dealing with. It became clear that only some of our people managers believed we really meant that and that only some of our people managers were skilled and equipped enough to have confident conversations where they placed their trust entirely in the hands of their team members. Many managers needed HR approval and we're now going back to our learning and development priorities for people managers, rebuilding our approach to management and leadership and putting flexibility right at the heart. Let me share a couple of quick uh, fire things that our colleagues told us too. A third of our people continue to find it hard to separate work and home life. 25% of people can't wait to get back to the office. 
But interestingly, when we carefully opened our offices recently, less than 50 of our 4,500 strong workforce are regularly going back to the office. As we've already heard, our people told us that women continue to bear the brunt of childcare responsibilities in lockdown and women who work part time are finding it particularly difficult and they're a demographic that we should all carefully support. 50% of our people just miss being around their colleagues and have reminded us that friendship is a core part of the working relationship and equal thirds of our colleagues tell us that their work uh, work life balance has improved, deteriorated or stayed the same. But counterintuitively, those who have full responsibility for homeschooling have reported the highest improvement in work life balance. All of these challenges for the future of, uh, but sorry, all of these things, of course, bring us challenges for the future of work and the future of flexibility at work, of course. And for me, perhaps most relevant to Peter's opening remarks, the most important learning in this period. Over half of our employees feel they're more productive in lockdown. And we've seen that through our long established, slightly naive productivity measures, but we have set, we, we are able to compare before and since. So our people tell us they feel more productive and our productivity has increased. Both of these would firmly appear to, bu to, uh, to bust the myth that flexible working compromises productivity. And if we aggregate the voice of our employees, our lockdown survey and productivity gains, and we see soaring levels of employee engagement in our firm, it means that our people are making the case for flexibility for us. I genuinely think that together we've dispelled the myth that some roles have to be office based. And I just think it won't be the case that we'll return to the old way of working. Um, uh, we were, uh, I was asked to think about things like how these learnings have impacted on our priorities. Now, I'll keep this section really short. This is really simple for us. Our drive to become an organisation that's obsessed with flexibility has never become more important. And I think now it's probably the single most important cultural attribute that we possess alongside customer obsession. It's gotten us through the hardest of times and this terrible situation has given us the chance to prove to people that our words are backed up with action and that new levels of flexibility are significant opportunities for, into, for us also to improve organisational diversity. We think that the workplace is likely to become a social space and we need to address that challenge, but it's not urgent right now. We strongly feel that for many organisations now isn't the time to be making wide reaching strategic decisions. And then outside of flexibility, the need to continue improvement, uh, continue automation and continuous improvement are definitely commercial differentiators for us and things that we need to drive very hard. And that our previous view of what represented good well-being interventions probably weren't enough. And that now emotional resilience and mental health, which we focus particularly on through lockdown, must be at the heart of our well-being initiatives. And, um, and with that, I'll draw to a close. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. And thanks to the other speakers. Um, we've had a number of great questions come in and some of our speakers have actually already started addressing the questions directly, which I'd like to encourage because we, uh, there's no way we're going to get to <laughs> all of them. Um, we, we might get to one or two of them. I'd like to maybe start with one question uh, as sort of a rapid fire question where we go through the speakers in reverse order, sort of starting with uh, Steve and then going to Hannah uh, or Steve or Emma. Uh, uh, and, then, and then going to Hannah, um, Emma, Stewart, and, and Peter. Um, now that we have two Emmas, uh, we're in slight trouble. So starting with Emma Francis. Uh, and the question would be, so it seems that everybody on the, on the panel agrees that flexible working is something that's, that's worth fighting for, although it's important to sort of get it right. Um, and to think about sort of who can and can't work flexibly and, and what different effects um, we've seen during COVID where uh, it's great that the stigma has decreased, but you know, the, the type of arrangements that we have seen are also ne not necessarily equitable or sustainable. Um, assuming that sort of a blended approach to flexible working where there's a general norm that people can work much more flexibly than before, but some people work, start working from the office more often than during lockdown is, is gonna be the norm going forward. 
Um, what would you say are sort of the, the one or two really important things that firms need to focus on in the short term to make that work well um, and to ensure that sort of the unpaid work burden, for instance, doesn't all fall on certain groups, such as women, um, and that it's generally as inclusive as it can be. So starting with, with Zurich, with Emma Francis. I guess um, I would firstly say the sort of practical um, technology side of things. So if there are people in the office and there are people at home, making sure that everybody can contribute to a discussion as effectively as if everyone is on Zoom. Um, but also it's really, it, from a sort of more cultural perspective, um, really sort of questioning any sort of push to go back to the old ways. Um, not, not when they're for good reasons, but when it more comes down to, I think, personal preference or, um, you know, sort of old, old ways of thinking and just constantly testing that and putting the argument to keep it more flexible. Because there are people who prefer to be in the office or who like to have their people around them. And that's understandable, but it shouldn't mean that they then affect everybody else's um, um, choices just because they're of their seniority in the organisation. So it's just continuing to make that argument, I think. Thank you, Emma. I'll pass it to Hannah. Yeah, really briefly, I guess the way I would approach any question like this is thinking whose behaviour do we really need to support? And I think of those busy managers who there are across, across so many organisations, such an important um, you know, player in this transition. And my challenge and suggestion to organisations and, and to um, an important um, HR function in organisations is what can you do to equip, equip your busy managers who are stressed and concerned with about lots and lots of challenges of business and organization challenges as well as their own. Lots of them are going to have to have individual, uh, individual conversations that are very similar with lots of their teams. And can you give them something simple that helps them cover a range of points that they might need to remember to make those really fruitful conversations? So, you know, a crib sheet or some kind of support that could enable them to each time have a really tailored conversation with each individual uh, member of their team or their team collectively so they don't forget important things um, but also so the burden is not so much on that busy manager uh, to remember and, and to, to expect that they have the skills and the practice necessarily to have those important conversations. That's a, a suggestion. Over to Emma Stewart. Thanks. So uh, two things I'd say which um, I was sort of touched on earlier. The first is recognize that you probably do need to train your managers in understanding job design and how to manage flexible teams don't just assume they know how to do this um, because they don't and we we're often very um we can be quite dismissive of managers capabilities but they need to learn how to do this um, uh, and the second thing is uh ask your employees for their ideas about uh how to make it work so continue with the pulse surveys don't just assume that because we're returning to the office um, the job is done because this is going to be uh, long term uh, and within that what I would say is uh, listen to what they say and respond so you may need to prioritize they may not be able to do everything they were going to do before so you may need to make some choices um, and then just the last thing I'd say is uh, we do have some guidance for managers and for employees on how to have the conversation about how to design jobs from both ways to avoid that non-conversation and really happy to share after um, after this webinar with participants if that's helpful. Thank you Emma. Uh, on to you Peter. Oh. Uh, we may have lost Peter. Sorry I was uh, just muted. Um, ah, great. Isn't, that, isn't that an expression we've all now learned in the new world? You're still on mute. Um, but anyway um, so I'd agree with everything that's been said. I mean, just the only other thought I'd add is, is that let's experiment and learn. I mean, we're, we're learning things all, all the time now. And, and I think uh, Emma from Zero made a really important point that when you have these different ways of working, you've got some people in the office and some people working from home, and these hybrid models that I think are going to emerge, you've got to make sure that you're including the people from home. And if we're honest, you know, we've had many circumstances that I can remember in my uh, working life where the people from home on the TV screen are up in the corner somewhere and then they're not included so there, there are lots of things we've got to learn and i think we've just got to try some of these ideas then start to build some principles that we then want to share with people i really like anna's point about nudge which is so much part of behavioral insights thinking 
but to nudge behaviors in these sorts of directions. And we'll get there best by thinking about principles, not here's a whole nut bunch of new rules and policies that everybody's got to obey. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think given the time, we'll probably leave it there. I just wanted to point people to uh, the Behavioral Insights Twitter feed also where we've been line, sort of live commenting this conversation to a certain degree and where you can follow up on um, this conversation. It's been recorded, so you can also access it if you sort of missed the beginning or if you want to share it with other people, um, that'll be hosted on our website as well. Uh, I think hopefully we've left you with uh, an understanding that this is quite an important moment in the world of work where there are a lot of open questions as to how the world of work will be shaped going forward and there are many considerations and it would be sort of a mistake to think that the best thing to do would be to sort of get back to the way it was before or to sort of default uh, into sort of a glide path. And in fact, I think it's, it's quite important to sort of take the moment seriously and to realize that it, there are many different design elements that if done right can really uh, improve many important aspects of the world of work, including equality, well-being, productivity, and the other aspects that we've, we've touched on today. So I want to thank our speakers. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, and for sticking so closely to the, <laughs> to the 10 minutes each. Um, and also, I'd like to thank all of the, all of the participants. Uh, it looks like we had more than 250 people uh, join, so that's fantastic. Um, and we hope you'll join us for some of our other Building Back Better webinar sessions to come in the next few weeks. So thank you very much.